Okay, uh, good evening. Okay, we're looking forward to this time, this symposium on history, science, poetry, or what in the world is it? <laughs> Understanding genres of Genesis one through three. Um, this symposium is one of the current functions of the creation project of the Carl H. Henry Center for Theological Understanding here at Trinity. Uh, the creation project is a three year project and it's funded by the Templeton Religion Trust, supported by the faculty, staff, and administration of Trinity International University. We are in the first year uh, of the project. This past June, we sponsored a conference in which major Old Testament, New Testament scholars, theologians, and scientists uh, were invited here to the campus and participated in an open discussion of the issues. All of us are in agreement that the Bible is a reliable and iner inerrant revelation of God. We are all concerned about the relationship between what the Bible teaches about creation, its theological articulation for today, and how that re relates to what is happening in the hard and soft sciences today. Through these three years, we will have numerous events with the same focus. This symposium is one of them. The overall goal of the creation project is to help cultivate an honest, well-informed, humble, and open conversation on the doctrine of creation in the academy and the church. The polarization within the church on this topic is well known, so much so that even raising the question often generates more heat than light. We need to learn to talk about this topic in ways that are more in accordance with Jesus' high priestly prayer for unity among us in John 17. Even when we disagree on certain difficult matters, we need to make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace without ever compromising on the truth of God's word. This evening, the topic is genre. What genre description applies best to Genesis 1 through 3? Is it history, science, poetry, or something else? Or are there multiple or mixed genres here? What kind of literature is it? And how does that help us to read and interpret the biblical text of Genesis 1 through 3 in a responsible manner? What exegetical and theological implications does this have for the evangelical doctrine of creation? Each of the panelists will weigh in with their view of genre in Genesis 1 through 3. Uh, let me introduce them to you here all at the start, and then they will come as, as the order will be set out. Todd Beale is a graduate of Princeton University and did a THM degree in Old Testament at Capital Biblical Seminary, and then earned his PhD degree, D degree at the Catholic University of America in New Testament Studies. Dr. Beale has written a monograph on the Dead Sea Scrolls and many other chapters and articles, including some on the early chapters of Genesis. He has taught Old Testament and Hebrew for the past 40 years, 36 at Capital Bible Seminary in Maryland, and now at Liberty University School of Divinity and the Master's Seminary. He and his wife Sharon have two children and five grandchildren. This is Dr. Beale here in the, in the middle. Tremper Longman earned his PhD degree from Yale in Old Testament and Ancient Near, East, Ancient Near Eastern Studies. He taught 18 years at Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia and now 19 years at Westmont College in California. He is a prolific writer, having authored over 30 books and numerous articles, many of which have been translated into other languages. Dr. Longman has been heavily involved in the discussion of science in the Bible having written or edited several various, several various works on the topic. Most recently, he is co-editor and contributor to the Zondervan Dictionary of Christianity and Science, which will come out next April. He and his wife, Alice, have three sons and four granddaughters. That's Tremper right there. Okay. And then John Oswald earned his PhD in Mediterranean Studies from Brandeis University in Waltham, Massachusetts, with a focus on reading the Old Testament against the background of the ancient Near East. 
He is currently a visiting distinguished professor of Old Testament at Asbury Theological Seminary and has also taught uh, both here at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and Wesley Biblical Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi. He too is a prolific writer, having authored 12 books and numerous articles, and is known especially for his two-volume commentary on Isaiah. Dr. Oltwald is an ordained minister in the United Methodist Church. He and his wife Karen have three children and five grandchildren. Dr. Oltwald, right here. Right behind you. The procedure uh, for tonight will be as follows. First, all three panelists will give a 15 to 20 minute formal presentation. First, Dr. Oswald, then Dr. Beale, and then Dr. Longman. Second, each panelist will give a 10 minute formal response. They will have all read each other's formal presentations ahead of time and have crafted their responses accordingly. All of this will take about 90 minutes. After the formal presentations and responses, there will be 30 minutes of discussion between the panelists and with the audience. For the audience questions, we will, pa we will be passing around three by five cards for you to write your questions on and pass up to me. Uh, we will collect these after the formal presentations and then again after the formal responses. If you like, you may address your question to one particular panelist or to the panel as a whole or whatever. I will organize the questions into categories and arrange them in the hope of representing your questions well. Even now I apologize if I do not get to your specific question, I will do my best. We'll conclude the symposium no later than 9.15 p.m. Now without further ado, the panelists will come to the podium one after the other for their formal presentations. So let's welcome first Dr. John Oswald. Thank you. In some of the recent communications about this event, I saw the word debate. Honestly, I'm not interested in debating. I'm not interested in uh, defeating an opponent or in scoring points. What I'm especially interested in is the sharing of differing positions in an attempt to understand all of the issues as well as possible and thus to be able in the end to arrive at a position which is intellectually consistent and intellectually honest. So I share with you some thoughts. When I think of the possible genres for the creation narratives of Genesis 1 and 2 particularly, four possibilities come immediately to mind. They are ancient Near Eastern myth, a broken Hebrew myth, theology using a space-time vehicle, and literal historical fact. The first of these, ancient Near Eastern myth, is, to my mind, the easiest to dispense with. When we compare the biblical narratives with any, and indeed all, of the standard creation myths found from Sumer to Rome, we find virtually nothing in common. In the first place, the literary style is different, with nothing of the fantastic or bizarre in the Bible that is characteristic of the myths. In the second place, Whereas the biblical accounts are resolutely located in this time and space, the significance, I think, of the days and nights in Genesis 1 and the rivers in Genesis 2, the myths tell of things happening in primeval time and space that not only explain the origins, in fact, not the creation, the origins of this world, but also function in their retelling to maintain the continuing existence of this world. In the third place, the Bible's understanding of reality is diametrically opposite to that of the myths. One example must suffice in this short compass. It is the distinction between the one divine being and his creation. 
The significance of God's speaking the worlds into existence cannot be overemphasized. Yahweh is not this world and cannot be represented by any part of it. Thus, on these three points, a different literary style, a different location in time and space, and a different understanding of reality, and others that could be mentioned, whatever Genesis 1 and 2 are, they are not myth. Furthermore, the suggestion that they, especially Genesis 1, are the result of the Hebrews' encounter with the Babylonian origin myth, the Enuma Elish, during the exile, is surely laughable. So, are the creation accounts broken myths? That is, were there originally mythical origin stories among the Hebrews that have been broken on the anvil of the later earth-shaking theological discoveries that the Hebrews made? To begin with, the Bible strongly denies that the Hebrews made any theological discoveries at all. The consistent testimony of the Israelites is that, far from being theological savants, as 19th century Europeans styled them, they were the most theologically obtuse people imaginable. They insist from start to finish that the one transcendent person encountered them in their space-time experience, told them what those encounters meant, and would not leave them alone, though they did everything in their power to drive him away. So this suggestion at the outset rests on a false premise. But suppose we grant that Yahweh's revelatory work began with, say, Abraham. Again, something the Bible does not suggest. Is it not possible that the Hebrews later went back and brought their ancestral myths into line with what God had revealed? Aside from the theological question about whether those reworked myths could now be considered revelation or not, we still must ask, where the remains of those earlier myths are to be found. In fact, there are none. The supposed transformation has been so complete that it is impossible to find the remnants of the supposed mythical elements at all. Are there details in the accounts which seem frankly unbelievable to us? Of course. But that does not make them mythical. Finally, the real reason people are inclined to put this option forward is that they cannot believe that God has revealed himself at all. So, if these narratives are neither ancient Near Eastern myths nor broken myths, are they revealed theology using the vehicle of time and space instead of the vehicle of nature as the myths do? This option is very attractive as the popularity of several recent books promoting this view in one form or another attests. However, we need to take a very careful look at this proposal. In the rest of the Bible, the theology is derived from what the one transcendent person has done and said in our space-time framework. That continues straight from the Old Testament into the New. Ultimately, the basis of the theology in time and space events and purposes is made the warrant for the validity of the theology. Let me say that again. Basing the theology in time and space and events and persons is made the warrant for the validity of the theology. Does the doctrine of election come first? And is the Exodus narrative a vehicle created to express the idea? Never. The doctrine of election arises from what God did in freeing his people from Egypt by grace alone. Was the resurrection narrative created to explain a late Pharisaic belief in resurrection? Again, I say, never. Or was the divine uh, was the idea of divine trustworthiness intuited and the Abraham narrative created as a vehicle to express it? Once again, never. Myth speculates on the nature of reality 
and then uses the natural world as a vehicle to convey those speculative conclusions. Are the biblical accounts only really different from myth in that they utilize time and space as the vehicle for their speculative conclusions? But someone may say that framing the question that way is unfair. We're not talking about speculative conclusions, they say. We're talking about revelation. But that having been said, my question remains. Has the mode of revelation changed between Genesis 11 and Genesis 12? Certainly after Genesis 12, the biblical claim, whether we accept it or not, is that the nature, character, and will of God were revealed in and through what he did in space and time. Unique events and persons in time and space are not the vehicle for a revelation previously received either through speculation or intuition. That is, history is not the vehicle for revelation, but its basis and ground. That being so, I am very reluctant to say that here in the early chapters of Genesis, the revelation has no basis in what God actually did in time and space. So then, does that mean that in my view, Genesis 1 and 2 are literal, factual accounts of God's creative activity through which we recognize certain truths about him? I would argue that on the basis of the straightforward, non-mythical character of the text itself, that should be the default position, as indeed it was in the church for 1900 years. However, that being said, there are certain features in the text that raise a red flag. For instance, both Genesis 1 and 2 cannot both be literally factually correct because they differ from one another on the facts. It might be argued that they differ only in genre with chapter 1 being more general and stylized and chapter 2 being more down to earth and detailed. But even if that is granted, there are still too many factual differences in the accounts to say that both are equally, quote, historical, close quote. Second, it seems to me that neither account has as its primary purpose to tell the reader or hearer what God did, but rather to tell us what is the meaning of what God did. Thus, the function of chapter 1, in my view, is to tell us what is the relation of God to the cosmos, to the earth, and to humanity, whereas the function of chapter 2 is to prepare us for chapter 3 by giving us the who, what, when, where, and why that underlie the tragedy reported in that third chapter. When these observations are coupled with recent scientific evidence for the great age of the cosmos and the earth, I conclude that Genesis 1 and 2 are not intended to be literal, factual accounts of the origins of the earth. But that exhausts my four options. What's left? I believe there is a fifth option, and that's the one that I've been alluding to throughout the previous explorations. This is what I, for want of a better term, would like to label as theological history. That is, just as elsewhere in the Bible, the primary goal here is not to give us as full an account as possible of historical fact, but rather to present historical facts in such a way as to show us what those facts teach us about divine reality. Thus, chapter 1 tells us in stylized form the order and purposiveness of divine creation as God did it. That that order corresponds very well with evidence on the ground for the order of creation constitutes strong evidence in my mind that this is in fact how God performed his work. For I cannot conceive of any person prior to Thales who would have imagined the origin of the world in this progressive fashion. If it be asked, 
how we can have night and morning before the creation of the sun and moon on the fourth day, I answer that the purpose of the language is not to express literal fact, but is a way of emphasizing that this divine activity took place in actual time, not primeval time, and in specific periods of time. Given that understanding, the creation of light before the earthly light bearers makes, in my mind, perfect sense. Again, the purpose of these narratives is not to give us a full account of the facts of creation so that we can reconstruct exactly what God did and how it all happened. Rather, they recount such facts and details as are necessary for us to understand who God is, what the world is, and who we are. They recount those facts selectively to fulfill the divine revelatory purpose. So then, here as elsewhere in the Bible, our theological understandings are based solidly on God's actions and words in time and space. If I were to attempt a reconstruction of creation on the basis of Genesis, I'm certain I would get it wrong. On the other hand, I'm convinced that when, by God's grace, I come to learn exactly how God created the universe, I will say, of course. That's just what Genesis says. Thank you. It's great to be with you this evening, and thank you for uh, coming out, even with this weather and with a Cubs game. Though some of you are probably White Sox fans anyway. I don't know, maybe not. <clears throat> um, you should have received also a, uh, a two-page uh, handout. Uh, if you're interested in uh, a, a full copy of my presentation, I've given you my email there as well. The basic purpose of defining a genre of a particular biblical passage is to help in the interpretation of its meaning. So when the New Testament uh, uh, says that Jesus spoke a parable, we automatically recognize that he's not necessarily speaking of an actual historical event. Instead, he's presenting a story intended to illustrate a particular point. Nathan's parable of the ewe lamb in 2 Samuel 12, 1 to 4 is an Old Testament example of the same thing. That's pretty straightforward. A major distinction in Old Testament studies is between prose and poetry. There are certain markers which indicates that a text is poetry, and there are other markers for a prose. In most cases, the choice is clear, though there are some Old Testament passages where it's difficult to tell. In the case of Genesis 1 to 3, and especially for Genesis 1, there are a, they, there are a bewildering number of genres proposed. But when there are so many different proposals, and surely it would be helpful to narrow down the possibilities, I agree with Gordon Wenham's observation. He says, the definition of genre refines and clarifies the message of Genesis, but disagreements about genre should not obscure our substantial agreement about the theological teaching of these stories. These chapters are making a profound statement about the character of God and his relationship to mankind. I believe that all of us uh, here on this uh, panel are in agreement that Genesis 1 to 11 and Genesis 1 to 3 in particular teach profound theological truths, including the origin of the world, the nature of man, man's relationship with God, the Sabbath, marriage, work, man's sin and God's judgment and provision for man's sin. And it's the overriding theological truths of these chapters that are most important. Where we differ is the extent to which we treat these chapters as basic factual history, or rather in a more figurative, less literal description of these important theological truths. Many would argue that Genesis 1 should be viewed non-literally because it's a separate genre from the rest of the book. Yet among those who view Genesis 1 as a separate genre, there's little unanimity as to its precise classification. Some say it's poetic, some say it's a hymn, and uh, others say many different things. I guess my uh, uh, favorite one is, uh, uh, is uh, Steck, who calls it a sui generis, its own genre. But if it's in Latin, it sounds a little better, I guess. But what, he's, uh, what I think that does is emphasize the uniqueness of Genesis 1. Well, surely, uh, 
we would agree with Steck that in theme, Genesis 1 is unique, but it's hardly unique in form. It's certainly, however, not a poetic passage. If you want to look at uh, poetic passages uh, that talk about creation, Psalm 104 is an excellent example of that. Psalm 104 is a poetic description of the creation, but Genesis 1 is not. Indeed, Genesis 1 is presented in a normal narrative form. Uh, since I wrote an Old Testament parsing guide, I must be fixated on this thing, so you'll have to excuse me. The standard uh, form for Hebrew for consecutive sequential narrative prose is the wow consecutive imperfect. Genesis 1 contains 50 such wow consecutive imperfect forms in its 31 verses, an average of 1.6 per verse. And uh, by contrast, in the poetic section of Genesis 49, there are only a total of eight well consecutive forms, or 0.3 per, ver per verse. So to put it another way, Genesis 1 has five times more narrative sequential markers than a comparatively long poetic section. So I don't think there's any doubt that the author of Genesis 1 intended that the narrative be understood as normal sequential action. The genre is narrative, not poetry. Similarly, the genre of Genesis 2 and 3 uh, may also be described generally as narrative prose. But in Genesis 2, 23, Adam's small speech definitely seems to be poetic in form. I wonder how many of you, uh, maybe with your bride, maybe you wrote some poetry to him. Uh, well, I think Adam's doing the same thing here in uh, Genesis. Though not many of you are going to admit it, are you, if you did? I did, um, at any rate. <coughs> Okay, uh, in chapter 3, verses 14 to 19, the judgment uh, speeches of God are all delivered in what again appears to be uh, poetic language, the judgment upon the serpent, the woman, and the man. Yet the bulk of Genesis 2 and 3 consists of narrative prose with the speeches of Adam and the Lord highlighted by their more poetic structure. Uh, Genesis 2 describes Eden, a river coming from Eden, and four rivers that flowed from it. Two of those river names, the Hittakel, an ancient name for the Tigris, and the Euphrates, are known today. The global flood described in Genesis 6 to 8 no doubt altered the topography of Eden and these rivers, but the detailed description of Eden and these rivers supports the idea that Genesis 2 and 3 describe a real place, not a figurative utopia that never actually existed. While some scholars hold that Genesis 1 or Genesis 1 and 2 should be taken figuratively, most evangelicals would hold to the essential historicity of Genesis 3 to 11, since Genesis 3 speaks of Adam's fall. And virtually all evangelicals think that Genesis 12 to 50 is largely historical, beginning with Abraham. And uh, we can give examples of that, but for sake of time, I will uh, move on. There's no basis, however, for separating Genesis 1 and 2 from the rest of the book, or to treat Genesis 1 to 11 as proto-history different from the rest of Genesis. That simply doesn't work. Genesis 12 would make little sense by itself without the preparatory genealogy given in chapter 11, where Abram, Sarai, and Lot are first introduced. But since Genesis 11 gives the genealogy of Shem, this connects it back to the genealogy of chapter 10, the flood accounts in uh, 6 to 9, and the genealogy of chapter 5. But in chapter 5, that's uh, a genealogy that begins with Adam itself, himself, and so that takes us right back to the creation account in Genesis 1 and 2, where Adam is first mentioned. So I think it's a bit of hermeneutics if one would take Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as historical people, but not Adam, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Well, I, I would say that uh, that is something that I think should be avoided. There's another uh, indication as well, not just these uh, genealogies, but uh, second, the structure of the entire book is based on the phrase, Ela Toledoth. These are the generations of, this is the history of, or the account of. That uh, expression occurs 10 times in Genesis. And each time the phrase occurs, it narrows the focus to something that's already been discussed. Heavens and the earth, Adam, Noah, and so on and so forth. Well, since six of these occurrences are in Genesis 1 to 11, and four occurrences are in Genesis 12 to 50, it seems clear that the author intended both sections to be understood in the same way as consecutive history. Therefore, hermeneutically, I don't think that there is any warrant 
for treating Genesis 1 to 11 differently from the rest of the book. In fact, the Toledoth and the genealogies that occur throughout Genesis 1 to 50 lead two scholars to conclude that the genre used throughout Genesis is genealogical historical, Hoffmeyer uses that term, or an expanded genealogy, Wenham uses that term. While that may be a bit of an oversimplification, it's closer to the mark than many attempts to define the genre of Genesis as a whole, and it helps to demonstrate that there is not a unique genre in Genesis 1 to 3 or Genesis 1 to 11. Now let's look at the New Testament use of Genesis 1 to 11. There are at least 25 New Testament passages that refer to Genesis 1 to 11, and 14 of these refer to Genesis 1 to 3. All appear to take the text as historical, and I think that provides important evidence as to the historicity of Genesis 1 to 3 and 1 to 11. The creation account is referenced by Jesus in Matthew 9, 19, excuse me, 4 to 6 in his discussion on a divorce. Uh, this passage is especially significant since Jesus cites both Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2.24 as scripture that is authoritative in settling the question of divorce. Paul cites Genesis 2.24, the two shall become one flesh, as authoritative in his teaching on marriage in uh, Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, also then uh, later on uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians um, in let's see, 1 Corinthians 6, 16, in his argument against sexual morality. The account of the fall is also regarded as historical by New Testament writers. In 2 Corinthians 11, uh, verse 3, Paul refers to the serpent tempting Eve by his craftiness. Once again, that speaks of the details of the account in Genesis 3 that emphasize the serpent's deception. And even more telling is Paul's discussion of the role of women and men in 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 14. In this passage, Paul gives two reasons why women should not have authority over a man. First, Adam was formed first, then Eve, referring to Genesis 2, 20 to 23, which states that Eve was created after Adam. And second, because Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression, referring to the account of Satan tempting Eve in Genesis 3. Eve specifically mentions being deceived by the serpent in verse 13. Another important passage is Romans 5, 12 to 14, which traces the beginning of sin specifically to Adam, explaining the death reigned from Adam to Moses. Here, both Adam and his sin are mentioned in the same phrase as Moses. If Adam was not historical, then what about Moses? And then we could look at the New Testament events, uh, uh, references to the events of ch uh, chapters 4 to 11 in a similar way way, uh, but uh, time constrains us from doing that. In the great chapter on faith, the writer of the Hebrews begins by speaking of God's creating the world. Uh, Genesis 1 then mentions Abel's better, better sacrifice than Cain, another detail from Genesis 4, Enoch being taken by God, and so on and so forth. And then he praises the faith of all of these other uh, great uh, saints. And so I would ask how we can take the people and events in verses 8 to 32 as historical but not those mentioned in verses 3 to 7. Seems that the writer of the Hebrews sees the entire uh, Old Testament in that respect as historically accurate. And finally, the genealogy of Jesus in Luke chapter 3, verses 23 to 38, ends with 20 names taken from Genesis 1 to 11, Terah to Adam, taken as historical persons along with the first 55 names mentioned in the genealogy. How can one decide that these final 20 names were part of primeval history and not historical, but the other 55 names are historical. Such an approach simply does not seem logical. In an attempt to get around the evidence that the New Testament writers view Genesis 1 to 11 as historical, some scholars believe that Jesus, Paul, Peter, and other New Testament writers simply accommodated their teachings to the views of the people of the day. But that position is untenable. First, in every case mentioned above, Jesus, Paul, Peter, and the writer of Hebrews bring up the passages in Genesis to validate their point. There was no need for Jesus to cite Genesis 1 and 2 in his discussion about divorce, but he did. There was no need for him to speak of Noah and the flood, discussing his second coming, but he did. There was no need for Paul to speak of the creation of Eve from Adam to verify his position on headship, but he did. 
Such alleged accommodation on the part of New Testament writers is not consistent with the doctrine of inerrancy. And accommodation on the part of Jesus is doubly prob problematic, not only in terms of inerrancy, but in, in terms of Jesus' integrity and sinlessness. Furthermore, Jesus wasn't exactly a wimp. Uh, he didn't hesitate to, cor uh, to correct the wrong views of the day. Five times in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus draws a contrast between what the religious leaders of the day were saying and what he taught. And so they form a very strong uh, 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 amount of evidence here, uh, both uh, Jesus and the New Testament, uh, that cannot be uh, evaded easily. Well, some fine Old Testament scholars, such as Tremper Longman, agree with my position that the wow consecutive verbal forms and the use of the Toledoth formulae point to, as he says, a continuity between Genesis 1 to 11 and 12 to 50 that indicates that the book as a whole has what he calls an historical impulse. That is, Genesis 1 and 2 informs the, the readers of the events that the author claimed actually happened in the past. Well, I'm delighted with that statement, but then uh, Longman states that because of various other factors, it's not a precise or literal description of these events. Bruce Walkie similarly uh, views Genesis 1 and 2 as figurative, and he and uh, Longman give several reasons, and I'm just going to uh, highlight a couple. First of all, the uh, two contradictory creation accounts alleged. Longman and Walkie both view Genesis 1 and 2 as containing two separate creation accounts. This position is a throwback to the old documentary hypothesis view of two or more separate authors for these two chapters, kind of like the multiple Isaiah view that thankfully uh, uh, John, uh, John Oswald does not uh, hold that particular position and neither do I. These two accounts are supposedly contradictory. For example, in chapter two, God apparently creates the man and plants a garden and creates birds and animals before creating the woman. Whereas in chapter one, the man and the woman are created after all the rest. But Genesis two is not a second chronological creation account. Instead, it is topical preparing the way for Genesis three. Whereas Genesis one focuses on the creation of the world, man included, Genesis two narrows its focus exclusively on man. Each element mentioned in Genesis 2 is necessary for a proper understanding of Genesis 3. There is no contradiction between the two chapters. Then there's the, uh, another uh, objection that is raised. Uh, Walkie says, for example, that a straightforward reading of Genesis 1, 4, and 14 leads to the in incompatible notions that the sun was created on the first day and again on the fourth day, end quote. This objection is raised by many other scholars as well. But the text doesn't speak of the sun being created on day one. Only light was created then. We are not told what the light source is, but it clearly wasn't the sun. The light of day one is a special creation of God distinct from the sun. And if some have a problem with understanding light without the sun, they should recognize something similar will apparently be true in the eternal state. According to Revelation 21, 23, and 22.5, the sun will be not, won't be needed at all since the Lord himself is the light. And I would say maybe some of this has to do with the fact that in many ancient cultures, the sun was regarded as a god. Well, God is, says, no, I create light without the sun. The sun wasn't created first, light was created first, and God was responsible for all of it. So just as in the first three days of the creation week in the eternal state, there will once again be light without the sun. Though we can't conceive of evening and morning apart from the sun, surely God can. Light could come from a temporary light source, since all that's required for a sunrise and a sunset to occur, evening and morning, is a directional light source and a rotating earth, and that we have. Um, then the structure of Genesis 1. I have argued that Genesis 1, like most of the rest of Genesis, with the exception of Genesis 49 and some of the other small passages I mentioned, is straightforward prose narrative intended to convey historicity. Yet I would certainly agree with those scholars that point out the repetitive structural features of Genesis 1. There are, after all, six days of creative activity, each normally with the following basic elements. God's command and God said, its fulfillment and it was so, God's assessment, God saw that it was good, and the close of the day, there was evening and there was morning. Certainly the repetitive structure aids in remembering each of the days. 
but it's hardly an indication that the text is not to be taken as historical any more than the structure of the Ten Commandments would indicate non-literalness. A number of scholars contend the structure of the days of Genesis 1 is symmetrical, with days 4 to 6 paralleling days 1 to 3, and that this symmetry demonstrates its non-literal nature. And uh, thankfully, I have given you in the handout my arguments against that because I knew that by this time, my time would be short. But I don't believe that these patterns hold up. Even if those patterns did hold up, it would hardly be an argument for a non-literal approach to the chapter, especially since the chapter has so many sequential markers. Just because something is presented according to a pattern does not mean that that pattern is non-literal. After all, as we previously discussed, the entire book of Genesis is patterned according to the Toledos. This is the account of. And so I would assume that uh, folks would not uh, regard things as being non-historical simply because they're in a pattern. As E.J. Young says, why then must we conclude that merely because of a schematic arrangement, Moses has disposed of chronology? So it's my conclusion that the simplest and the correct approach to Genesis 1 to 3 as well as to Genesis 1 to 11, is to take it as literal, historical account, just as Jesus and the New Testament writers did. There's no need to apologize for such an approach, and indeed, sometimes fundamentalists have been criticized because they've changed their view of Scripture. James Barr takes us to task for that. He says, well, as the scientific approach came to have more and more assent from fundamentalists, they shifted their interpretation from literal to non-literal in order to save the inerrancy of the Bible. But Barr says, in fact, the only natural exegesis is a literal one in, that this, in the sense that this is what the author meant. Oddly, I'm on the side of Barr in that particular case. Where does the figurative hermeneutic stop? As mentioned earlier, critical scholars have long held that all of Genesis was figurative myth. Once one decides that Genesis 1 is figurative or Genesis 1 to 3, where does it stop? Thankfully, from my perspective, Bruce Walkey still holds that Adam was an historical person. Tremper Longman, however, says that it's not necessary for Adam to be historical since Paul in the New Testament may be making an analogy that doesn't require Adam to be an historical figure, even though Jesus is. Of course, Peter N. goes even farther than that and basically says that, um, uh, basically says that uh, uh, Paul was wrong. So, is there a separate genre in Genesis 1 or Genesis 1 to 3 that would permit such different hermeneutical approaches? My answer is a resounding no. I don't believe that there is any reason to take uh, them uh, in any other way but literally to use another hermeneutical genre and apply it in some piecemeal fashion is to embark on a slippery slope that ignores the plain evidence given by our Lord, the New Testament writers, and I believe by the text of Genesis itself. Thank you. Good evening, and I commend you too for turning out on a cold, rainy night when the Cubs are playing. If the Phillies were playing, I probably wouldn't have shown up to give my paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, John. Thank you, Todd, especially for ripping the heart out. No, to presenting some of my big points. But at least, uh, but at least, I by repetition, you'll you'll get to know a couple of. Uh, the main points that I do want to make. But let me start by saying the Bible is without error in everything that it intends to teach. Now that, of course, is a concise statement of the doctrine of inerrancy. And all of us who are speaking today would affirm this understanding of the Bible as the word of God. I affirm the inerrancy of Scripture. The question is not about the authority of Scripture, but what does the Bible intend to teach about cosmic and human origins? And that raises the question of genre. So I would disagree with the quote from Gordon Wenham, which says that genre is a secondary concern. Authors write in generic traditions and embed signals so that readers know how to take their words. And I give you an example on your handout here. Uh, in a text called The Personal History of David Marplethorpe, the first paragraph of supposed uh, 
biography. He begins, the clock on the mantelpiece said 10.30, but someone had suggested recently that the clock was wrong. As the figure of the dead woman lay on the bed in the front room, a no less silent figure glided rapidly from the house. The only sounds to be heard were the ticking of that clock and the loud wailing of an infant. That's wailing. So, uh, so as we interpret that and ask questions like, uh, who's the dead woman on the bed, our, our, our first interpretive intuition would say it's probably the mother of David Marplethorpe who had just been born and she died in childbirth. Who's the figure going silently out of the room? Well, probably the midwife. Um, and we could go on from there. I'll just use those two examples. But now let's read Murder at Maplethorpe, okay? The clock on the mantelpiece said 10.30, but someone had suggested recently that the clock was wrong. As the figure of the dead woman lay on the bed in the front room, a no less silent figure glided rapidly out of the house. The only sounds to be heard were the ticking of that clock and the loud wailing of an infant. Now, if we ask those two interpretive questions again, uh, who's the, who's the, uh, or how, how did the woman die? Rather than saying in childbirth, we would guess, since it's a murder mystery, that she died at the hands of somebody. Who's the figure going silently from the house? It's not the midwife, of course. It is the uh, murderer. All right, so genre triggers reading strategy. That's the point that I would make from this little example. Thus, it is necessary to reflect on the genre of anything we read, including the Bible, if we're to read it according to divine intent. What does it intend to teach? So let's turn our attention now to Genesis 1 through 3. And let me begin with two preliminary comments. The first, first the question of the genre of Genesis 1 to 11 and Genesis 1 through 3 is often presented as a choice between two alternatives. Is it history? In other words, giving a literal depiction of events. Or is it myth, that is, having no real connection with actual events? So my first comment is that there's no reason to think that there are only two possibilities. But you know, people on both sides of this question want us to think so. You know, those who read it more literally as plain fact often want to depict the other side as opting for a poetic slash mythical no connection to referentiality. And people on the other side who say myth would characterize somebody who reads it as sort of plain language, literal fact, as kind of an unthinking fundamentalist. Again, uh, we need to avoid this unfortunate and unnecessary characterization of the question of genre. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting that my two colleagues are doing this, but you do hear that kind of rhetoric out there in this discussion. Second, as we address the question of genre, we need to remember that the Bible, while written for us, was not written to us. Uh, this language comes from my friend John Walton, uh, but it's a very important thing to keep in mind. The Bible, while written for us, isn't written to us. The way I communicate this to my undergraduate students is to say, they don't call the book of Romans, Romans for nothing. It's written to the church at Rome, and to understand that book well, we have to First of all, imagine ourselves in that particular cultural situation. When it comes to the Old Testament books, we have to remember, again, to borrow a phrase from, a, from John Walton, we need to put ourselves in the, quote, cognitive environment of the time in which the book was written. Let's now question, uh, tackle the question of the genre of Genesis 1 through 3. And I'm going to begin by talking about the structure of the book of Genesis as a whole. According to one reasonable understanding of the structure of genre, and books can be outlined in more than one way, it falls into three big parts. 
Genesis 1 to 11, the primeval history. That's one title that we can give to it that takes us from creation all the way up to just before the time of Abraham. And of course, this covers a tremendous period of time quite concisely and does so with the narrative focus on the entire world. When we come to Genesis 12, all of a sudden the narrative focus tightens up on one individual, Abraham. And for even more chapters than we uh, covered the whole history of the world from creation to this moment, we're now going to follow more closely and specifically the life of Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob. We then have uh, Genesis 37 to 50, the Joseph narrative. In the concluding part of Genesis, the focus is on Jacob's sons, particularly Joseph, though Judah is an important secondary character. The major difference between the patriarchal narratives and the Joseph narrative is that rather than short episodes, the Joseph narrative has the coherence of a novella or short story. Though these three sections demonstrate differences in style and focus, I would argue and will argue that they share the same basic genre, which I call theological history. Let me begin by saying that by characterizing the history as theological, I don't intend to undermine its nature as history, that is, referring to real space and time events. The entirety of Genesis is making historical claims about real events that happened in the past. What are the signals that Genesis, and in particular Genesis 1 through 3, is speaking about real events that take place in space and time? Well, I offer the following, and these, these have already been mentioned. First of all, the Toledot, the Toledot are another way to structure the book of Genesis. This term, this Hebrew term Toledot, often translated something like account, occurs in a formula that occurs 11 times in the book of Genesis as, as this is the Toledot of X, where X is typically a personal name, except in the first occasion in chapter 2, verse 4. And, uh, and this is the Toledot of X, introduces a section of Genesis which focuses in on the sons of X. So the Toledot of Terah introduces the story of Abraham, the Toledot of Jacob introduces the story of Joseph, and so forth. So I would point to these Toledot formula, first of all, as providing a signal that we have a consistency of genre within the book of Genesis, but also suggest that it indicates a historical interest throughout the book of Genesis. Secondly, I would, as Todd pointed out, I would further argue that the author's choice of verbal form supports this interest in the past, though perhaps not as strongly as Todd suggests. In short, and for those of you who know Hebrew, the narrative employs the vav consecutive verbal form that is typical to narrate past events. The caveat, of course, is that the vav consecutive can also be used to tell a story, like a fable or a parable, which is not based in real space and time events. Um, I think, though, that the continuity with the rest of Genesis and indeed with the redemptive history that follows, established by the Toledot formula, renders it much more likely that the use of the Vav consecutive intends to tell us about past events in Genesis 1 through 3. So as I read Genesis 1 to 11, including Genesis 1 through 3, I believe the genre signals are telling us that these events, creation, fall, flood, Tower of Babel, happened in the past. Now, some might have expected me to throw in genealogies, and Todd mentioned genealogies, and perhaps I should. After all, the stories in Genesis 1 to 11 are connected by various genealogies. 
My only hesitation comes from my recognition that ancient Near Eastern genealogies aren't constructed on purely gen for purely genetic and historical purposes. Um, again, reading it in its cognitive environment. That said, while not strictly historical, they are at least partly historical. So, so far I've emphasized the continuity between Genesis 1 to 11 and the rest of Genesis, uh, and have suggested that that shows an interest in historical referentiality. In the next part of my paper, I'm going to point to signals that to me, indicate that the author is not giving us a kind of literal, factual depiction of these historical events. I'm going to mention four such features. The first is that Genesis 1 contains many obvious figurative descriptions of real events. And let me just mention a couple of examples. The first is day one's relationship to day four. And also taking into account the recurrent phrase evening and morning. And to put it quite simply, you can't have a literal evening and morning without a sun, moon, and stars. Granted, God could come up with alternate means of flicking on and off the light on a 24-hour period, but that still wouldn't be a literal evening and morning. And let me at this point simply point out that this is not a modern insight or reading of the text. And on your outline, I have a quote from Origen. Actually, Origen has a much more extensive comment to make. It's at the very end of the handout. And this Origen's comment here is not unusual for the early church. Origen says, and excuse him for his rather feisty comments here, uh, he says, to what person of intelligence, I ask, will the account seem logically consistent that says there was a first day and a second day and a third day in which also evening and morning are named without a sun, without a moon, and without stars, and even in the case of the first day, without a heaven? Okay, so uh, I won't give my second example there, but I will give my second reason, or my, what I take as a second sign, that we're not to take the depiction of the events in Genesis 1 through 3 as a literal description of these events. And that has to do with an intense interplay with ancient Near Eastern texts uh, in Genesis 1 to 11, particularly in the creation and flood stories. And of course, I'm only going to talk about the creation story now, though I am writing a book at the moment on the flood. Today, we have the benefit of studying Genesis 1 and 2 in the light of ancient Near Eastern accounts of creation, in particular compositions like the Enuma Elish, Atrahasis, and the Baal myth. These stories, or comparable ones, would have been known to the original audience. There are similarities, yes, but there are also intentional differences. I'm not saying they're similar. I'm just saying there's an intense interplay which we need to describe both similarities and differences. Indeed, this interplay often has what I would consider to be polemical purposes. And the one example I'll give is Genesis 2-7 and the example of God creating Adam from the dust of the ground and the breath of God. First of all, again, I would point to this as what I think a natural reading would understand to be a figurative description of it, since God doesn't have lungs. But also, it is interacting with and critiquing the Mesopotamian Canaanite view on the nature of humanity, since we know from the Enuma Elish and Atrahasis that they conceived of humanity being created from both a part of creation, the clay, and a divine element, in the case of Enuma Elish, the blood of a demon god, Kingu, and in the case of Atrahasis, the blood of a god and the spit of the gods. They all spit in it. And the biblical depiction 
gives us a dignified perspective on humans at their origin, whereas the Mesopotamian account is a very contemptible one. Third, I will raise the issue of what I call sequence concord and react to uh, Todd's characterization of this as some kind of hangover from the documentary hypothesis later. I will simply point out that I agree with those scholars who see that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 have certain tensions, if not contradictions, if we take them literally in terms of the sequence of creation. So that, what I would take as a lack of interest in giving us the exact sequence of creation would lead me to think that we're not getting a literal depiction. One final comment um, that suggests to me um, that we may be getting a figurative description rather than a literal, precise, detailed description of how God created creation. I would say that we have an analogy between what we see in Genesis 1 through 11, which talks about the very, very deep past, and say the book of Revelation, which talks about the far distant future. In other words, the, uh, in both texts, they're talking about real events. You know, Revelation is talking about the return of Christ, which is actually going to happen. But as it's being described, it's being described in figurative terms. It does, there's no conflict between the use of figurative language and uh, actual events. And I think the same things happen in, in terms of the deep, distant past. Well, let me add a comment on the role of science in biblical interpretation and then give a short conclusion. Some people criticize the approach I take here as a caving into science. That's a very pejorative way of putting it. But I would not at all disown the fact that I'm mindful of science as I interpret the text. As Pope John Paul II said, science can refine religion. I would apply that to my field of biblical studies by saying that scientific discoveries should drive us back to the text to make sure that we're interpreting it correctly. And again, one might cite the Galileo incident as a sort of moral lesson to the church. After all, science studies nature, God's other book, and his two books will not ultimately contradict each other. So a short conclusion. Genesis 1 and 2, like the rest of Genesis and much Old Testament narrative, is theological history. It talks about the past in order to tell us about God and our relationship with him. Genesis 1 through 3 tells us that God created everything, including humans. However, while Genesis 1 through 3 does inform us that God created everything, it doesn't intend to tell us how he did it. <clears throat> Thus, we can turn to science to ask the question of how God did it. Evolutionary creationism, in my opinion, is no threat to the truthfulness of Scripture. The same may be said about the fall. God created humans morally innocent and capable of moral choice. At this point, and of course, I, if one accepts an evolutionary theory, it comes to the point in the evolutionary process where Humans are morally innocent, capable of moral choice, and at that point, God endows them with the status of being created in his image. Humans, however, decided in real space and time to rebel against God and thus introduce sin and death into the human experience. Thank you. Okay, we're passing around uh, three by five cards for those of you who might want to write a question. Okay, and we will uh, be collecting them. We're passing them around right now, so I think probably what we'll do is let you think about a question really based upon the past, past formal presentation or one on the responses that are coming. 
okay? And then we'll pick them up afterwards, okay? After the responses, I'll orient them, or maybe we'll get some in between so that I'm ready to go when we get to the discussion time, okay? Okay, very good. Okay, so we're moving on now to the 10-minute formal responses from each of our panelists, again, beginning with Dr. Oswald. It's important, I think, to distinguish between literary form and genre. There's no question, as both Todd and Tremper have said, that the book of Genesis, except for short fragments, is in the form of prose. But that does not then foreclose the discussion of genre. Discourse and parable are often cast in the form of prose. But that does not mean that either is therefore literal historical narrative. Function has at least as much to do with the determination of genre as does literary form. Second, the differences between chapters one and two cannot be both cannot be gainsaid. They cannot both be literal historical accounts. If one is, then the other is not. They are both historical in nature. And I'll say more about that in a moment. But they are not both literal history. In fact, I would argue neither is literal in the sense that neither can be used to reconstruct exactly what God did. I would insist that if we knew what took place, we would find that both reflect what happened, and that without distortion, but that they are differing interpretations of what took place in service of differing revelational purposes. Third, when we emphasize the Toledot structure of the entire book of Genesis, we are not thereby establishing the literal historicity of Genesis 1 to 3. What we're actually doing is demonstrating that the entire book is a carefully structured interpretation of certain historic events, some from a more literal perspective and some from a less literal perspective. Fourth, for a document to be historical in nature, that is, reflecting genuine historical events in an accurate fashion, is not thereby to make it literal history. And I think that's an awfully important distinction we need to make. In this regard, there are almost an infinite number of degrees of differentiation from historical to literal history. A historical novel for which the author has done a great deal of research into diaries of the participants, eyewitness reports of the events, etc., may be truly historical, but it is not literal history. In this regard, I would argue that there is a significant difference between the intention of Genesis 1 to 11 and that of Genesis 12 to 50. Are both sections historical? Certainly. Is there an intended historical connection between the two sections? Absolutely. Are they therefore both of the same genre? No. Genesis 1 to 11 is painting with a broad brush covering great sweeps of history in a few verses, covering great spans of time between the tragedy of Genesis 3 and the first distinct step to reverse that tragedy in Genesis 12. On the other hand, Genesis 12 to 50 covers barely 250 years in 39 chapters. The two parts of the book are both prose narrative, but they are not doing the same thing. Are Genesis 1 to 11 historically accurate? Yes. Are they literal history in the same sense that Genesis 12 to 50 are? No. What do I mean by that? I mean that it is much more difficult to reconstruct the precise events of Genesis 1 to 11, and especially Genesis 1 to 3, than it is to reconstruct the events from chapters 12 to 50. Fifth. It will not do to retreat to miracle. God created day and night before there is a sun to resolve a difficulty. Revelation tells us about light, but there is no night. Day and night before there is a sun and moon, I think I have to agree with Origen. 
Certainly God could have stopped the rotation of the earth so that the sun appeared to stand still in the sky for Joshua's long day. But did he? All the evidence is that he did not. Was the day miraculously lengthened? Yes. But how it was accomplished is another matter. Where our reading of the Bible in relation to the physical cosmos differs from that of scientific research, we need to be very careful. In the paper Dr. Beale gave us in advance that formed the basis of his presentation tonight, he spoke of evolution as the elephant in the room, suggesting, I suppose, that the conclusions of much of scientific research form something of a hidden agenda in the discussion. I don't think that's the case. I think the findings of scientific research are the issue. If it were not for those findings, such as, for instance, the probable high antiquity of Homo sapiens, I don't think we'd be having this discussion at all. The issue is whether we can continue to assert the truthfulness of the Bible if at least some of the conclusions of scientific research are correct. James Barr, whom Dr. Beale quoted, would like to force us fundamentalists, as he labels us, into an either-or position where either scientific research is correct or the Bible is. Of course, the either-or argument is one of the most common logical fallacies. In almost all questions, there are several other options between the polar opposites. Yet, when we Christians seek to adopt such other options, Barr accuses us of intellectual dishonesty. Too often, our problem is that we have taken the Bible's statements regarding sensuous reality as a simplistic statement of physical fact. Take, for instance, the prose statement in Genesis 7:11 that there are windows in heaven and springs of water on the floor of the ocean. Some want to argue that the ancients understood these to be figurative statements. I see no more evidence for such an understanding there than I do in Genesis 1 to 3. I think those statements were understood to be literal factual statement. It is only as we began to understand physical reality better that we had to find another explanation for the statement. Are we being intellectually dishonest when we say that it is a fact that there was a flood of catastrophic proportions resulting both from an unheard of outpouring of rain from the sky and an uprush of water from the sea, but that the actual description is understood to be figurative? That having been said, I do not privilege the results of scientific research over the Bible. If scientific research purports to tell me about spiritual reality, I rule it out of bounds. Thus, I see no way to equate Genesis 1 and 2 with standard evolutionary theory. If we suggest, as some seem to do, that there is no conflict between those chapters of the Bible and Darwinian evolution, I believe we face hopeless contradiction. The keystone of Darwinian evolution, as I understand it, is that the process began, continues, and ends in mindless chance and that the entire process can be explained from within the cosmos, which is, by the way, only a depersonalized form of the understanding of reality that we know, first of all, from ancient Sumer 5,000 years ago. Whatever else Genesis 1 and 2 tell us about origins, they fly squarely in the face of such assertions. The impetus for creation was from beyond the cosmos, and is a result of divine conception and intention. Furthermore, it was guided at every step of the process by that divine intention. Was there development within species? It seems to me that Genesis 1 allows for that. Did the process take a lengthy time? I do not believe that either Genesis 1 or 2 rule that out. Would I have thought so merely from reading Genesis 1? No. But now that scientific research has presented what I believe is incontrovertible evidence of a lengthy process, I need to look at my text again. Assuming the great age of the cosmos is correct, what should God have said to Moses, for whom the number 10,000 
could be equated with infinity. Should he have said, well, Moses, actually, I began this process 4.5 million billion years ago. The purpose of Genesis 1 is not to tell us the age of the cosmos. Rather, its purpose is to tell us what creative activity means for the nature of reality. Thank you. Well, I feel a little bit more relaxed this time. If you noticed, I was speaking very quickly last time because I knew I would have too much to say. Uh, but uh, uh, John was much smarter than I was in that he prepared a statement uh, for a bit of a rebuttal. Although I didn't hear much of a rebuttal of Tremper, so I feel like it's, I don't want to sound like Donald Trump, but it feels like two against one, but uh, that's as much of a Trump analogy as I will make. And I, I apologize, I apologize for that one. Uh, seriously, um, I would say that I have the greatest respect uh, for John Oswalt and his commentary on Isaiah. I have loved, I think it's fantastic. I think it's the best commentary out there and he didn't pay me to say that. Uh, I just think he's done a tremendous, tremendous job. Um, and likewise, uh, Tremper Longman, uh, uh, many of his works I think are fantastic. A few I don't think are quite as fantastic. So I would say on most issues, I mean, I would say 97% I would agree with uh, John and maybe 90% with Tremper. So when we have to talk about our differences, it usually involves, at least for Tremper and me, especially this particular uh, topic. Um, uh, no, I, uh, I, I don't quite understand this uh, distinction, um, historical and literal, because I think that basically what's happening in Genesis 1 to 3 is continuing on through the rest of uh, Genesis, as I said. And uh, yes, of course, what happens in Genesis 1 is quite different from anything else, because we're talking about the origin of the world. Uh, by the way, and I really didn't get into the age of the earth issue, I really could care less how old the earth is. My, um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the choices here uh, for genre, I think, was scientific or something like that in the, in the, uh, in the heading of this whole uh, symposium. Uh, no, I don't think Genesis 1 to 3 is uh, intended to be scientific, but here's the difference. I do think that it's accurate in what it says, and when I say accurate, I mean that it's not contrary to genuine science. And uh, uh, so, yes, I think a literal understanding is correct. I'm not trying to look at Genesis and trying to, uh, you know, somehow think it's a scientific textbook. Absolutely not. Um, you know, it's funny because sometimes people even get upset at the Bible. Well, it talks about sunrise and sunset, and then you turn on what? You turn on your uh, evening news, and what does it say? Sunrise and sunset. We know the sun doesn't rise and set. It's the earth that moves. And uh, by the way, that thing about the light, I still don't get it. All you need, take a flashlight. I wish I was a little bit more uh, uh, flexible right now in my age. Uh, take take a, a, a flashlight as your light source, all right? And I'm the earth. This is where the demonstration really falls apart because, you know, I'm, I'm rotating around. It doesn't need the sun. The only reason it needs the sun is because that's the only way you and I can think of it because we've never known of a light source other than the sun. Now, I think that's limited thinking. Now, exactly what the light source is, it doesn't specify. I do think the reason, as I said, or having the difference between that light source in day one and the sun is because God is making sure we understand the sun isn't to be worshipped. It's God who is to be worshipped. And again, I would agree with both of these gentlemen that what Genesis is trying to do is to teach us, yes, theological history. Of course it's selected. It's selected just as, in fact, the gospel accounts are also selected. And in fact, if you want to argue in terms of uh, time spans and all the rest, well, if you look at uh, you know, Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, boy, they spend a lot of time on just what? That last week of Jesus' life. Hmm, you know, there must be something up there. 
No, I don't think so. It's just that that particular element uh, obviously uh, needed more time. So I don't see that the difference in time uh, is really persuasive for seeing a different genre, uh, especially since I don't see any marker. I would ask uh, John Oswalt, I would, I would ask, well, where do you see this switch over? You know, is it magically in chapter 12? Is it magically in chapter four? Is it magically in chapter three? How do you determine this switch over? Because I don't see it in the text. I have to laugh about the use of origin. Um, origin? Really? Yeah, that would have been a little better. I just happen to have the Jets article, September 1981. Well, I happen to have because I knew that you were going to do this quote. Origin and the Inerrancy of Scripture by Michael Holmes. And he talks about Origin's uh, method. And of course, Origin had three views of Scripture, the spiritual, the moral, and the literal. The literal is, of course, the worst from his point of view. And in fact, as he puts it, uh, well, he says, uh, he, he contrasts John's narrative of Jesus' arrival in Capernaum, the cleansing of the temple, with that of the synoptics, and concludes that here and at many other points, it's impossible to reconcile the conflicting narratives. And he says, well, that's no problem. Just, they're, they're just not literal. They're not correct. And he says, in terms of the evangelists, what they did, where possible, they proposed to, and this is a quote from Origen, they proposed to speak the truth both materially and spiritually, but where this was not possible, it was their intention to prefer, the spirit, to prefer the spiritual to the material. The spiritual truth was often preserved in the material form, as one might say, by means of a lie. <laughs> well, I don't like Origen's view of scripture. Uh, if you want to follow it, that's fine with me. Uh, I prefer Calvin. I could quote from Calvin here uh, and his view of Genesis 1 and 2 if we want to just do quotes to prove our points, but I think we can all get certain quotes which will uh, be fine. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, I don't think uh, Origen solves the issue of uh, the evening and the morning uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 1. And uh, so I would uh, basically say that, uh, and no, I didn't uh, uh, talk about uh, evolution. Uh, I basically deliberately left it out, and I did have a little piece in the end of my uh, paper. Uh, but I do think that it is the influence here. It is not a reading of scripture that drives us that way. It's an, 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 an honest attempt. In other words, I don't think, I, I, I think the motivations are, are very honest to try to see uh, if we believe that evolutionary theory or part of evolutionary theory is true, then how do we uh, uh, reconcile uh, inerrancy with that? And I, I, I appreciate that effort. Uh, my issue is, and I started out as a pre-med in, in a, a student in pre, uh, Princeton University. I had four years of uh, science in high school, four years uh, in, uh, at Princeton. So I had eight years of evolutionary teaching. But I'm a pretty thick skull, and somehow it didn't really uh, uh, I, I was basically uh, researching that uh, topic from that point on. And I believe that there is more evidence than ever against Darwinian evolution. Uh, sadly, m many evangelical scholars uh, just defer to the current scientific consensus. Um, I, I believe in lab experiments where um, basically you, can, uh, you have an, a hypothesis, you test that hypothesis, and then uh, you, you determine whether it's correct or not. But with evolution, it's outside uh, science, uh, 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 so-called, as far as I am concerned. There is not that, not, that uh, kind of, uh, there's not that kind of testing that can be done. Um, I am very much interested. Any time any student gives me a paper and it's got just their assertions with no evidence, I say, well, you know, forget it. I don't care what your position is. Even if you disagree with me, you've got to provide good evidence, and that's uh, the key. You can't do that with uh, evolution. You can't do that in terms of origins. Nobody has the video, although when I was debating Hugh Ross on this issue, he says he has the video. <laughs> what he means is, and I appreciate it, the stars tell the story. Well, okay, but uh, no, God, uh, and, and um, 
God does uh, deal in miracles. All of creation, I would say, is a miracle. Uh, so uh, to say, well, gee, you can't have a, a, a temporary light source in, in day one and then the sun in day four, you can't resort to that because it's a miracle. Well, what else do we think is going on in creation? I think it's a pretty big miracle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me say thank you to both my colleagues here. I think if Borgen was wrong about anything, uh, his comment about what person of intelligence would hold this view, uh, you know, uh, Todd is definitely a person of intelligence that I have uh, interacted with on this issue before, and he does so very civilly as I hope to do as well. And John and I have known each other for many years, being on the Central Translation Committee of the New Living Translation together, so we've spent many, many, many hours together talking about the Bible. Maybe that's why we both ended up with theological history. And indeed, <laughs> why we, uh, yeah, you know, no collusion was going on there. But, but indeed, I, I largely, largely agree with John, so I won't, comment uh, right away on his, though I'll come back to some comments he made about evolution in his response. Uh, and I, you know, there's much that I agree with Todd about, too. I mean, uh, I agree with him that Genesis 1 to 11 is not a separate genre from the rest of the book. And maybe that is one place where I disagree with John, but I wonder whether we're just using uh, terms slightly differently. I agree with uh, Todd that Genesis 1 is narrative prose, but I don't think that's going far enough. That's, narrative prose is a broad category. The next question is, what type of narrative prose? Um, and, and indeed, by the way, I'm responding to the, the, the long paper, which he couldn't, so if some things don't sound familiar to you, it's coming from that paper. Um, I question that, quote, the detailed description of Eden and these rivers supports the idea that Genesis 2 to 3 describe a real place, not a figurative utopia that never existed. I mean, yeah, there are three known rivers in Eden, the Tigris, Euphrates, the Gihon. The first thing, the Gihon that we know is in Jerusalem. The Tigris and Euphrates are in Mesopotamia. The Pishon we don't know about. They're also flowing out, which according to present geography would be in Armenia, not in the ancient Near East. Uh, but of course, Todd would appeal to the drastic changes that would take place in the global flood. And I, I just can't go there. The fact that the Tigris and Euphrates are mentioned is a piece of what I would call mimesis as it's describing, the, uh, it, describing Eden. Uh, so I agree that there is continuity within Genesis, but I also agree, uh, but I also believe there's this narrative discontinuity, which I tried to point out in my paper. In terms of the New Testament use of Genesis 1 to 11, um, he says, quote, there is no indication that he, referring to Jesus in this case, I believe, takes either the creation of man in Genesis 1 or the account of the creation of even Genesis 2 as anything but historical. I would counter by saying that there's no indication that he does take it as historical. In other words, the New Testament in these instances is referring back to the biblical accounts. And in my book, How to Read Genesis, you know, when I'm talking about Adam and Eve, uh, I talk about Adam and Eve, even though my own view is that a uh, individual couple at the beginning of Homo sapiens isn't a necessary, uh, a necessary belief to affirm the truthfulness of scripture. Um, yeah, and also I, I believe a lot of his argument in this section is based on the faulty premise that the New Testament authors can't link historical individuals with archetypal individuals who represent real people. Okay, so I'm not saying Adam's a fictional character, I'm saying Adam may represent original humanity. Um, so, and again, I got the papers while I was traveling, so I didn't have the time to 
to, and speaking at other institutions. So this is a little episodic here, like uh, the patriarchal narratives. But, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, of course, <laughs> like the hidden patriarchal narratives. Um, you know, my view that I explained about the two creation accounts isn't a throwback, as he says in this paper, to the old documentary hypothesis, which I don't accept. Um, it's just an observation that we have two creation accounts here. I don't think that's uh, something that can really be countervened. The story is told twice with different emphases, but it's not, my views are not connected to the documentary hypothesis. At one point he says, and, and uh, he says, though we cannot conceive of evening and morning apart from the sun, surely God can, and you were talking a little bit about that point as well. And I'm really not exactly sure what that means except as a preface to appealing to miracle, which um, the text itself doesn't suggest. I mean, I was being a little bit facetious like Origen when I wrote in my notes, I'm sure God can conceive of the moon made of cheese, but it isn't, you know, so just that God can conceive it. In his comments about the framework hypothesis, this structuring of the days, you know, I'll agree with you that it's not a, any kind of slam dunk argument against the historicity or the possibility that this is presenting an actual sequence. So I wouldn't use the text in that way. I would say, though, that you criticized it based on um, the fact that the the view of the framework hypothesis, which sees the first three days as the creation of realms, and then the second three days talking about the rulers of the realm. And I think that's an, an inaccurate way of describing it, though some people do describe it that way. I would take the second three days as describing simply the inhabitants of those realms. I, I do want to challenge you on this comment, which you brought up not in your paper, you passed over it in your paper, but you did mention it in your comments. You say, I believe there is more evidence than ever against Darwinian evolution. And I would just simply ask, wonder what you're reading. <laughs> because uh, I've been hanging out with a lot of biologists lately because I'm on the advisory council of the Biologos Foundation, where there are a lot of evangelical evolutionary creationists, plus I'm on the advisory council of a Science for Seminaries program that the American Academy for the Advancement of Science is doing. And uh, we discuss this issue, and in no uncertain terms, the biologists in the room, again, Christian biologists, said, you'll hear this comment, and there's no foundation to it. Yes there are questions about the mechanism of evolution, but not about the general theory of evolution. And so, um, so some people take the discussion within the evolutionary community, as I understand it, remember I'm not a biologist myself, questioning different models of how evolution works and then say the whole theory is up for grabs and from what I'm told in no uncertain terms, that is not true. Um, and then I'll just comment on his quotation of Noel Weeks, which I don't think you read, did you? Uh, Noel Weeks, at the end of his paper, he quotes him saying, the basic question is whether our interpretation of the Bible is to be determined by the Bible itself or by some other authority. When science has been set up as its own autonomous authority, inevitably tends to determine the way in which we interpret the Bible. And, but you did represent that perspective, and I simply protest that description uh, and say, again, that it's perfectly legitimate uh, to, to go back to the Bible and see if we're interpreting the Bible correctly based on scientific ideas and archaeological conclusions as well. So I guess just a comment to John, because I only have one minute left, uh, on his comments on evolution. And I, I would simply say this, that, and I can't explain it here, not only because it's one minute, but also because, again, I'm not a scientist. But scientists have explained to me the difference between chance and randomness. So I'm going to send you some things that 
point out that chance doesn't mean, you know, anything goes. And evolutionary creationists like, um, oh, we'll talk about uh, convergence and, and things like that. It's not, well, in any case, I'll send you some stuff about that, John. And then secondly, I think we need to have a more hearty doctrine of providence as we talk about God's involvement in the, human of, in the creation of humans. I mean, you look at the book of Esther, and you read Esther, and God's name is never mentioned there. He's not doing miracles. He's not making his presence known in these wonderful events. But everybody who reads Esther knows why the Jews survived this threat. It's because of God. So that's one of my objections against the intelligent design community. I think they worry if you don't see the finger of God in some kind of dramatic way, then God's not involved. So those are a few comments. Yeah.